Good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Don't get much better than this place. I tell you what, I was thinking about you all are in the midst of revival. And tonight, I'm, I'm going to talk about taking risks. And, you know, revival is a time of taking risks. Amen? I mean, revival is a time of where we're supposed to be revived by the Spirit of God. We're supposed to be rejuvenated. We're supposed to be called back to the place where God wants us to be to submit to His authority and yield to His direction. Amen? Amen. And, and revival is a time where we get recalibrated. You know, I've heard people say many times that you know, revival is something we should do every day. Well, I, I disagree. You see, there are days where I feel closer to God, and there's days where I feel further away from Him. But I always need His direction. Amen? Amen. And so, tonight I want to talk about taking risks. Before I do, I want to share a story with you. You know, I was raised by my grandparents. You three have no idea how good you have. <laughs> I'm not knocking my grandparents. They were the salt of the earth. I loved them dearly. They were the two most influential people in my life other than Jesus Christ. I love them. I talk about them every day. I try to as a way to honor them. But let me tell you something about being raised by your grandparents. They don't play. <laughs> this whole deal where, you know, you hear about grandparents saying, well, I get to spoil my grandkids and get to send them home. Huh. When did that start? <laughs> I don't know nothing about that stuff. Now, my grandparents loved me. They gave me everything I ever needed. And they made sure I had plenty of discipline. I tell you this because tonight I'm going to talk about taking risks. And one of the risks I took when I was six years old. You better listen, boy. Okay. Because <laughs> I told my grandma a lie. I know y'all ain't never done that before now. <laughs> Let me tell you something. You lie to somebody, but you don't lie to Grandma. Because she's going to bust your tail. And you know what's bad about that? Is I lied early in the morning. So I got my tail busted early in the morning, and then Papa came home. And she told him what I had done. And she went ahead and told him. She went ahead and whipped me, but I might need a little more. So I got it twice that day. My grandpa didn't play. He was one of them guys that counted. You know what I'm talking about? You don't stop. One. Two. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? My grandpa got the three one time and it changed my life forever. <laughs> All right? But I got my tail busted for telling a lie. I took a risk, right? The risk to me was worth telling a lie than telling the truth to my grandma. I, I bought the lie, right? I, I fell for it. If I just told the truth, I might, I might still got a whipping, but I promise you I wouldn't have got to. But I lied, right? And it reminds me of a, of a story I shared this Sunday with our congregation. And this has to be a true story because Jerry Clyer told it. <laughs> Y'all know who I'm talking about, don't you? No. Uh, Jerry Clyer talked about the lead bag. You know who I'm talking about. And he told this story about Uncle Mercy Ledbetter. said he was an unbelievable man. He was a father figure for him. Because you know, if you don't know this, Jerry Clyer didn't grow up with a daddy. <laughs> he told this story. He said, Uncle Mercy, he went over to see him, and Uncle Mercy was just worried. He was at his wit's end. And he said, Uncle Mercy, what's wrong? He said, it's New Gene. My boy, New Gene. He said, he, he's a great young man, but he cannot stop lying. He'd rather stand on his head and tell you a lie, stand on his feet, look you and I tell you the truth. He said, that boy's a liar. I, I can't break him. And Jerry said, well, well, Uncle Versy, why don't you call the preacher see what he can do? Uncle Versy, that's a great idea. Jerry picked up the phone called the preacher. Preacher answered and said, preacher, you've got to come down here. Bring two or three of the deacons with you. They said, what's wrong, Jerry? Somebody's sick? Somebody died? He said, no, New Gene can't stop lying. He said, I don't know how to break him, so I'm calling you for help. Preacher said, maybe what we need to do, Uncle Versi, maybe we need to, maybe we need to lie. Maybe we need to tell New Gene a lie. 
Maybe when he figures out that he's been lied to, he'll be embarrassed and disappointed and he'll get to feel the way he makes all of us feel when he lies to us. Uncle Bert said, I think that's a great idea. Come on down here. Come on now. Hung up the phone. A few minutes later, here comes the preacher, three or four deacons. He hollered for New Gene who was out in the field. New Gene, get in here. The preacher wants to talk to you. New Gene comes inside and the preacher says, New Gene, you ain't going to believe what just happened. Then she said, what? What happened, preacher? He said, me and the deacons having a meeting at the church. So we was in the sanctuary and all of a sudden the doors of the church blew open and in come the biggest grizzly bear you ever seen in your life. Probably 1,500 pounds. He said, you believe that, New Gene? He said, yes, sir, I believe it. He said, well, you ain't going to believe what happened next. He said, after that grizzly bear came in to about a three and a half pound chihuahua dog come in behind him. You believe that, New Gene? He said, yeah, I believe it, preacher. He said, well, you ain't going to believe what happened next. He said, me and the deacons, we was all afraid that grizzly bear was going to come eat us. But before he could come any closer to us, that chihuahua dog opened his mouth and swallowed that grizzly bear whole. He said, do you believe that, New Gene? He said, you bet I do. That's my dog. <laughs> hey, listen now. I'm not going to tell you a yarn like that tonight, but I'm going to tell you the truth. But what I want you to know is the truth I'm going to tell you tonight it's a truth you've got a choice with. You can let it come in one ear and pass right on through the other or you can let it stop somewhere in between and dwell on it and apply it to your life. Here's, here's the thing, church. Listen. God has not called us to serve Him sitting still. Amen? You're in the midst of a I don't care if there ain't two people here. Numbers ain't got anything to do with the nearness to God. Amen? It ain't ever been about numbers. It's been about nearness. And tonight I want you to understand that God is here. He is in your midst. And He has called you to something bigger, better, more unbelievable than you could possibly ever comprehend. You know why? Because He knows you better than you know yourself. He knit you together in your mother's womb. He created you on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose. What are you doing about it? It's time for us, church, to step into that purpose and do what God has called us to do. Are you ready, church? Amen. Turn your Bibles to the book of Philippians, chapter 2. Philippians, chapter 2. I'm going to share a few verses with you tonight. and I hope that when we get done, you're ready to be a risk taker. Philippians chapter 2, we'll start at verse 25 and read down to verse 30. The Bible says, this is Paul writing, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, and my companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger, and he that ministered to my wants, for he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him and not on him only but on me also lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life to supply your lack of service toward me. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Tonight, I want to talk to you about the Greek word that is translated risk. It's a long word. I'm not going to ask you to spell it, but I do want you to remember it. The word is parabaluamai. Parabaluamai. It's a term that's used when speaking about gambling. Now, before you go get mad at me, don't, I'm not here advocating gambling in church, amen? But I am here to tell you that God has called us all to be risk takers. He has called us to step out in faith and to trust 
him. And this word parabolomai, it means pushing all your chips to the center of the table. It means going all in on what God has called you to do. Hey, listen, there is no bigger risk than sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with the world. Amen? Epaphroditus was a guy who risked his life, not only for Paul, but he risked his life for the gospel of Jesus Christ. How many of us could say that? You know, I hope that everybody here tonight has a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. My, I, my prayer here tonight is everybody has been born again. Everybody knows what it means to know Jesus as Lord of your life. But do we know what it's like to risk our life for the sake of the gospel? When was the last time we risked rejection by sharing our faith? When was the last time we risked failure to pursue a God-given dream? When was the last time we risked our reputation by refusing to compromise our convictions? In this passage that I read, Paul refers to Epaphroditus four different ways. Let's look at it real quick. They're all in, in verse 25. First, he calls him my brother. My brother. Paul calls Epaphroditus my brother. What an honor. Can you imagine what an honor it would be for the Apostle Paul to call you a brother? Just so you know, this was not a common term in those days. In those days, you were either slave or free, Jew or Gentile. You were either educated or not educated. There was none of this brother-sister stuff. Okay? This was a term of endearment. But listen, Paul doesn't give it casually. He says, you are my brother, not because they shared DNA. You are my brother because they shared the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen? They were both in it. To win it, they both made Jesus Lord of their life. He calls him my brother. The second term, he refers to Epaphroditus as my companion in labor. My co-laborer. Epaphroditus was a man who was a worker. You know, I believe Christians ought to be workers. Amen? Amen. Hey, nobody gets a free ride. Right? We all got to earn our keep. My grandpa used to tell me that all the time. Every morning I wake up, I love playing sports. And that was a trade-off. In order to stay late for practice, I had to get up early and work at the sawmill with my grandpa. Monday through Saturday. To stay out late in the football game, playing football on Friday night, I had to also be ready to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. It's all lumber. That was the trade-off. Right? Every morning he wake me up and said, boy, it's time to earn your keep. Time to earn your keep. And when I got over, he used to always tell me, if you're going to be stupid, boy, you better be tough. But we still get up 4 o'clock no matter what time you get home. He called him a co-laborer. They were in it together. The next, he refers to Epaphroditus as a fellow soldier. You know, Paul had enemies. Because he was willing to step out of his comfort zone, because he was willing to accept the call that God had placed on him, because he was willing to be a risk taker, Paul created enemies. You've got to understand something. Paul was a Pharisee. They were a very eclectic group of people. And all of a sudden, on his journey to Damascus, Paul encounters Christ and everything changes. Here was a man who once persecuted Christians. The Bible tells us in the book of Acts that he consented to the stoning of Stephen and that the people laid their cloaks at his feet. And he watched Stephen be stoned to death. A godly man, the Bible says. And he did nothing. He was in fact on his way to imprison Christians when he encountered Jesus on the Damascus Road. But he calls Epaphroditus a fellow soldier. Paul had made enemies. Many times Paul's life was put in danger. He was 
falsely accused. He was placed in prison. He was stoned. One time, they put him in a basket, let him down over the wall, because people were lying in wait to kill him. And Epaphroditus was no different. This is why Paul says, you're a fellow soldier. You don't just get that term. You're not born into that term. Unless you're born again. Epaphroditus risked his life. Just to give you a little history, Paul is in Rome. And Epaphroditus was a member of the Philippian church. And they take up a collection for Paul. And they, they get a good sum of money. But here's the problem. Who's going to take it to him? And Epaphroditus steps up and he says, send me. And he goes on this perilous journey. Almost 800 miles. Six weeks of travel. Carrying a large sum of money. It's a miracle of God that he even got there. But here's something else. On his way he gets sick. He gets so sick that the Bible says he almost dies. But he gets this word. He gets this love offering to Paul. And Paul is writing the Philippian church, thanking them, but also praising Epaphroditus and calling him a fellow soldier. Epaphroditus was the essence of what it means to be a spiritual soldier. Someone who is willing to lay their life down. Someone who is willing to set their comfort aside for the lives of people they don't even know. You've heard it said many times. We live in America. The land of the free. That freedom does not come without a cost. And neither does our spiritual freedom in Christ. It costs Jesus his life. But no man took it from him. He willingly laid it down. Paul calls Epaphroditus a fellow soldier. Lastly, he calls Epaphroditus a messenger. Look at verse 25. Your messenger. You see, Epaphroditus had made this journey. He not only carried this gift, but he carried a letter to Paul expressing the sentiments of what was going on with the church. And Paul later writes, man, my heart is full because of what's happening at the church of Philippi. This was affirmation. You see, listen, it's hard to suffer for Christ. But it's even harder if you don't think your suffering is amounting to anything. Amen? Imagine being Paul. Paul talks about being shipwrecked. Read the book of Acts. One time the ship was torn apart. He was a prisoner and floated to shore on a piece of the ship. He'd been beaten. He'd been whipped. He'd been stoned. And even when he stepped out on the island, he got bit by a poisonous snake. Amen? He'd been placed in prison. He'd been persecuted. Can you imagine what joy crept back into his soul when he gets this letter from his fellow brother Epaphroditus that says things are good. God is blessing here at the Philippian church. Oh man, persecution doesn't get easier, but oh my Lord, it sure gets worthwhile when you know that God is doing something on your behalf. What if we approach our call back? What if we saw ourselves as fellow soldiers willing to lay our life down for the sake of the gospel? What if we saw ourselves as co-laborers with one another? Can I tell you something? I'm not the pastor here. He is. But do you know what? We're all on the same team. Amen? Amen. <laughs> We're on team Jesus. And I don't see my church in competition with your church. I see us as co-laborers working together to make heaven bigger. God bless churches that don't see it that way. And can I tell you something? They're out there. They're out there. I've watched churches talk junk about pastors of other churches to get people not to go to their church, but come to their church. Yeah, it happens. Christian folk are mean folk. Amen? In the book of Acts, Paul talks about all the things he had gone through. All the harsh realities that he experienced. And you know what he says at the end? And above all this, I deal daily with the lives of the churches. 
he ends this, this diatribe of all the bad things that had ever happened to him. And he sums it up with, I still have to deal with the drama of the church. Because God's people ain't pursuing God. They're pursuing power. They're pursuing greed. They're pursuing sin. They're pursuing relationships that aren't healthy instead of pursuing the one that gave his life so that they may have life to the full, the Bible says. Paul was a risk taker, and he's acknowledging another risk taker, Epaphroditus. <laughs> now there's three things I want to talk to you about risk real quick. First, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Now you, you can say amen to that if you've ever experienced faith. Amen? Hey, listen, faith is not an open book. Sometimes God doesn't reveal the second step until you've shown enough faith to take the first step. A few months ago, Rebecca and I were a part of a church that we've been a part of for 16 years. We, 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 us along with a few other families started the church. There were 12 of us. Six husbands, six wives. We started a church from the ground up. My three kids, that's the only church they had ever known. I remember our first Sunday, we had 23 people. We met at Southern Guilford Middle School. That's where we started out. Rebecca and I would, would get up before any of our children were born. We would get up on Sunday mornings and we would take her SUV and we would go around and pick up football players that I coached that wanted to come to church but didn't have a way. That car only held seven people. I think we got 25 in it. <laughs> but we took them to church. Most of the time we'd leave church, we'd take them and feed them and then take them back home. I remember there was a time in the life of our church we ended up moving to Randleman High School. And the reason why we moved is because Rebecca and I taught there. And Miss Kathy taught there. One of the greatest teachers on the face of the earth. But we went there because every time we would try to do something in Guilford County, they'd shut the door. But we'd come to Randleman and they would say, come on, do whatever you want. And all we want to do was love on people. Right? And I remember we ended up moving our church there and we were in the theater. And we were having a Sunday morning service and I was preaching and I, I don't know why I did this and what planned. I just stopped and said, hey, if you're here today and your kid came to Vintage Church before you did as a parent, would you stand up? I think at that time we had about 150 people and about 140 of them stood up. <laughs> Parents who had come to church because their kids had been coming for six and seven months before that. It was unbelievable. I had watched these kids who, and I'm talking about high schoolers now, middle school and high school students who had come to church, who had began, who had created, who had found a relationship with Jesus Christ, had gone back home, had gone back home to the only environment they had ever known, and they were witnessing to their mamas and their daddies, or whoever it was that was raising them. Some of them were being raised by their aunts and their uncles. And they were bringing them to church. It was an unbelievable sight. And I'm telling you this story because I want you to see the significance. Rebecca and I, we, we were, we were, we were I was pastor there, and we served there, and, and, and the church began to grow, God began to bless, people began to get saved. The first, first person, first salvation that we ever had as a church was a young man I led to the Lord on the 50-yard line of the football field after football practice. First person we baptized. We were so young as a church, we had to borrow a baptismal from another church that hadn't used it in 20-some years. Had to go get it from them, bring it to our church, dump people, drain it, take it back to them. Several times we tried to buy it. But we were so young as a church. The majority of our, our people that were coming to our church were under the age of 23. That's great when you think about the future of the church. 
It's horrible when you pass a plate because ain't nothing working. <laughs> but we had roots in this place. God had blessed in this place. We were serving in this place. Fast forward 16 years. And I felt this calling on my life to not to leave. But I felt like God was saying, man, there's a church over here. They've got all the pieces. All they need is somebody to come in and lead them. Somebody to rally the troops. They've gone through hell and back. I think it ought to be you. I had gone over there to preach, to fill the pulpit. And the first Sunday I preached, one of, one of the, the people on the leadership team came and said, hey, would you think about doing this full time? I said, absolutely not. I, I mean, yeah, I'll pray about it, but I, we love where we're at. Shows how much I know, right? <laughs> Fast forward six months, I'm sitting in front of my wife going, hey, I've got something I need to tell you. I've got something we need to talk about. I've got something we need to pray about. Right? And it wasn't an easy conversation. Listen, she looks innocent. She looks pretty. But man, when you guys sit down and have a tough conversation, it ain't easy. Now, we've always had one, ain't we? Yeah, but it ain't been easy. And that night wasn't easy either. She said, why? Like, it's not like we're just going through the motions. It's not like we just go to church. We won't. Like, we're plugged in. This is all the church our kids know. And all I can say is, Maybe we just need to step out and think. What if we look at it like this? What if it's not us leaving vintage? What if it's... What if it's us being obedient? What if that's what it is? September the 14th, I preached the first sermon as a pastor at Lovejoy Church. Can't tell you what I preached on can't tell you if it was good. can't tell you if it was bad. Here's what I can tell you in the past few months. God's stirring something over there. And it ain't because of case. I promise you. It's because people are willing to step out in faith and take a risk. Listen, church. It ain't about the music. It ain't about how eloquent the preacher is. It ain't about how much you love each other. It's about how much you love God. And what if we made it about God? Can you imagine that for a second? What if we made church about God? What if it didn't matter what color the fabric was? Or what the walls looked like? Or whether we had stained glass windows or not? What if it was just about God's people coming together with one common purpose, one common desire, to come into His presence, to yield to His authority, and to celebrate His goodness. What if it was about that? Is there a bigger risk that's worth taking? I can't think of one. I can't think of one. Listen, God is good. Hey, look. <coughs> you don't have to be able to quote this book. All you've got to do is be able to confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. I'm here to tell you tonight that faith is spelled R-I-S-K. My great-grandma -great used to say, no risk it, no risk it. <laughs> you ain't willing to put it out there, you're not going to reap any kind of reward. Hey, listen, church, we've got to be able to step out in faith. Here's what I'm convinced of. I don't have anything to prove this by. What I'm going to tell you is Casey talking, not the Bible. I hear people talk a lot about when they get to heaven. I've heard people say that when I get to heaven, I'm truly going to feel all the mistakes that I've made. All, all the sins that I've committed. I'm going to see them for what they are. I disagree with what I think we're going to see, what I think we're going to feel the repercussions of are not the sins we committed. Not the sins of commission. But the sins of omission. 
the risks we didn't take, the opportunities to share the gospel that we shied away from, the opportunities to step up and serve and meet a need in the house of God that we held back from, the excuses we made, and the explanations to justify those excuses. That's what I think is going to haunt us. Now I do know, and this is my hope, that all we're consumed with is Jesus when we get there. Is worshiping Him. I think that's scriptural. But I do think there's going to be some opportunity there to feel some of the pressure of the times where God called us to step and we stayed. Listen, if you believe heaven is real, then you believe hell is real. If you believe hell is real, you believe heaven is real. But you know what's equally real? is the presence of God. And God knowing and telling us that He didn't make us to sit still. God has created you for more. I told you that last night. I don't care if you're 8 or 88. God has created you on purpose, with a purpose, for a purpose, to carry out His will. And listen, if He can make a donkey talk to Balaam, he can get somebody you. All you've got to do is get out of the way and let him take over. Amen? I believe our greatest regret will be the sins of omission. The times we didn't step. The times we stayed. You see, every risk has a ripple effect. You're only one decision away from helping make heaven a bigger place uh, uh, a few years, a few uh, months ago, I was preaching at Lovejoy, and, and I was talking about Joshua. And, and, and as as he was, you know, Moses has, has died, and Joshua's now in command, and he's led the children of Israel into the Promised Land, and he reads a passage that Moses had written, where he tells the children of Israel in Deuteronomy to continue to tell the story of what God has done so that their children and their children's children know how God showed up, how He took them out of bondage and into the promised land, how He led them, how He gave them manna from heaven, how He gave them water from a rock, how He tore down the walls of Jericho. Tell your children so they'll tell their children. And there's this thing that Joshua does. He builds an altar, a monument out of rocks. The first one he builds is when they cross into Jordan. He builds two that day. He builds one in the middle of the river after God had parted the waters, and he builds one on the other side. And I can just imagine, as those children of Israel are crossing that dry creek bed of the Jordan River, you know, not all of them were adults. You know that, right? There were some little ones that wandered across there, maybe even were carried by their parents or on their, their mothers' and fathers' backs. And I can imagine, fast forward a few years, here they are, they're growing up, and, and they're walking into the camp, and they see this pile of rocks. And I can see them tugging on their mom and daddy's robe and saying, Hey, mama, hey, daddy, what's that pile of rocks for? And they get to sit them down and tell them the story of how good God is. You see, every risk has a ripple effect. What is God calling you to do? What's He calling you, you to invest in? What, where is He calling you to serve? What ripple effects are you keeping from happening because you refuse to step out by faith? Church, listen, we must quit making excuses. Excuses don't explain and explanations don't excuse. We must stop expecting all the pieces to be put in place before we step out in faith. Listen, when I wanted to get married, I didn't wait till I had plenty of money. Amen. <laughs> you want to hear something funny? At one time, I was a teacher, a preacher, and a farmer. My wife said, if you pick another profession, I'm going to punch you in the face. You pick the three poorest ones that there could ever be. I didn't wait till I had plenty of money. I didn't wait till I had a dream house and 80 acres of land before I got married. Listen, I ain't very smart. But when God placed a godly woman in front of me, I married her. You know why? 
Because I ain't very good looking either, and they may not come another one. I married her. And I thank God every day that I married her. Because they ain't a better example for our three children, especially you two. You don't know this yet. You really do, because you're 14. Okay? But you're 10. You don't know what an awesome example you have as a mom. Don't nod your head yet, because you don't know. Okay? One day you're going to know. It's going to click. Right? And you're going to thank God for that woman right there. Okay? And here's my advice. You better start thanking God for her right now. Okay? Because I do. Every single day. Right? I can't teach you how to be a woman. I can't teach you how to be a mother. Right? You need to look to her. Here's my job for you. Hmm. To teach you how to be a man. A godly man? Look at me. Loves his spouse. <coughs> Understand? He loves his spouse second. And he loves his children third. And it doesn't matter about what comes after. You understand me? <coughs> Here's the thing. I didn't wait until I had all the pieces together. She came into my life and I married her. And we had a few years as husband and wife. And, and you know what? They were good. But we didn't wait till we could afford having a baby. We decided it's time to have children. And you were born. Coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. It was unbelievable. I can't tell you how many calves I brought into this world, but there's nothing like watching your own kid come into this world. You hear me? <laughs> Y'all don't have children yet, do you? Went on the way. Yeah, I know. But you didn't have any before that, right? Uh -huh. Let me tell you something, man. It's the coolest thing. You better be there. I don't hear nothing about I'm, I'm scared of blood and all that stuff. <laughs> you, you get in there. You videotape it. You post them. I don't know. <laughs> you be there, you be in all of it because there ain't nothing like it. There's nothing like you came out, you look like an alien when you came out. Alright? I, I I almost tried to push you back in. It scared me a little bit. Okay, okay. It's nothing like seeing your child born, man. Right? But see, my point is, we didn't wait till we had everything figured out. We stepped out by faith. Church, here's what I want to know. When did, when did we decide that it was more important for our comfort level, for our needs to be met, before we stepped out and was obedient to God? When did that change? I'm telling you, I, I don't care how much material wealth you have. I don't care how much knowledge you have about the Bible. I know that matters to me. Are you willing to step when God says step? Are you willing to take a risk when God calls you to be obedient, that's what I want. That's what matters to me. And that's what ought to matter every time we come into the house of God. Amen? Every time we open His Word, every time we have a conversation outside of here with somebody, it ought to be about putting Him first and obeying His Word. Because the last time I checked, the Bible says that obedience is better than sacrifice. God's not concerned with what you lay down. God's concerned about you saying, yes, sir, I'm on my way. Church, it's revival. Are you ready to step out and be a risk taker? That's the question. Turn your Bibles. To Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to share one more thing and then I'm going to shut up. I've got a bachelor's degree in history. And because I have a degree in history, I had to take a lot of economics classes. Now, I'm not an economist, but I did listen a little bit in class. I had to take several, I had to take four or five economics classes. And here's what I learned that there are four basic valuation methods. So if there's an accountant in here, don't, don't hold me to task, okay? It may have changed, but there are four basic ways that economists assign value to things. The first one is called a discounted 
cash flow analysis. It's where you try to figure out the present value of a company or a business. The second one is called a comparable transaction method. This is for a company that's planning to do an acquisition or, or start the process to engage in a merger. The third one's called the multiples method. This is where uh, you're concerned with investing in the stock market or for making a price of earnings determination. That's the, this is the method you would take. And lastly, there's something called a market valuation. This is where you take into consideration supply and demand and market niche. And that's how the world places value on things. But you see, the kingdom of God operates a lot differently. In the kingdom of God, there are two valuation methods. The first one's called the creation valuation. And it starts in Genesis 1.26. And it said you were made in the image of an almighty God. Do you know what that means? That passage actually says, let us make man in our image. You are made in the image of God. That makes you valuable and irreplaceable. Now I'm not telling you this, you can walk out with your chest stuck out, but I am telling you that the creator of the universe decided to make you in his image. There's a creation valuation. You see, there's never been, Miss Kathy, there's never been anybody in history like you. Do you know that? There will never be anybody like you ever in the future. Did you know that? Think about that for a second. We can say that about everybody in here. There's never been anybody in all of history that thinks like you, talks like you, acts like you, worships like you, prays like you, studies like you, reads like you, nobody ever. And there will never be another person just like you. Now before you get the big head, that's not a testament to you. That's a testament to the God that created you. That's how beautiful God is. That's not a testament to you. It's a testament to the God that created you. That's the creation valuation. The second one's called the redemption valuation. And here's what the redemption valuation says. The true value of something is really based on what someone is willing to pay for it. God was willing to pay for you. John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever should believe within Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know what that means? It means you mean the cross to Jesus Christ. You were valued so much that Jesus willingly laid down His life. He walked 750 yards down the Via Della Rosa carrying a 350 to 400 pound cross on his shoulder that he would eventually be nailed to after he had been whipped 39 times because they believed 40 would kill a man. Spikes were driven into his wrists and to his feet. And he was hung on a cross in between two sinners. And he was mocked. Can you imagine that? But can I tell you something? The spikes ain't what held him to that cross. You and I held him to that cross. His love for us, his payment for our sin is what held him to that cross, not those spikes. Listen, we have a redemptive value. Why? Because God put such a high value on us that he sent his only begotten son to die in our place. Church, I don't know about you, but that's worth stepping out in faith over. I want to close with this. Turn your Bibles to Philippians 3. Philippians 3.
want to share this with you. I'm going to read the first ten verses. This is Paul writing. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the Spirit, and rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he had whereof he might trust in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yet doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made comfortable unto his death. Paul says a lot in those ten verses. But here's what he's trying to convey. If you think you know God more than me, you're wrong. If you think you know the law more than me, you're wrong. Paul said, I'm a Pharisee. If you don't know much about how Pharisees were trained, they had to memorize the Old Testament word for word. He says, nobody knows the law like me. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you about my religion. Let me tell you about the way I was brought up. I count it all as dumb. It's rubbish. It's trash when compared to knowing the excellency of Jesus Christ. You want to know why Paul was able to call Epaphroditus a risk taker. You want to know why he was able to call him a parabaluamai? It's because Paul was one. And he was one because of the change that Jesus Christ had made in his life. Listen, I have this fear. You call it rational, you call it irrational, you call it whatever you want. But here's my fear. I fear that when people die, that who, who have lived their whole life dedicated to a religion, dedicated to a denomination, dedicated to a church, I fear when they stand before God, He will say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Because their whole life, they were consumed by following a religion and never once took the risk to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We serve a Savior, not a behavior. And you say, preacher, it matters how we act. You, you bet your bottom it matters how you act. It matters how you live your life. It matters the words you use. But let me tell you something. Nothing matters more than a living, breathing relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm going to say this to you, and it's probably going to make some people mad. But I'm going to say it anyway. If Jesus isn't enough to change you, He's not enough to save you from hell. If Jesus isn't enough to change you, He's not enough to save you from hell. Read this book. It's all through here. He went to the cross. He risked it all to have a relationship with you. What will you risk for Him? Let us pray.
Father, I don't know how you want to end this service, but I do know this. You have called each and every one of us to trust you, to step out by faith, to lay it on the line, to be obedient to the call that you are placing on our lives. My question is this, what will it be? What will you do that's going to make heaven bigger? I ask myself that same question. Lord, we think about our legacies here on this earth. I think about my boy and my two girls and my wife. That if you were to call me home, what legacy would I leave behind? You see, that legacy is not about me. It's about what I leave for those I leave behind. God, you, you wrote in Deuteronomy that we reap from vines we did not plant. We harvest from fields that we didn't own. We draw up water from wells we didn't dig. God, you have always gone before us. God, continue to go before us still. Help us to trust that you will always go before us. And give us the faith to follow you. God, help us to step out in faith. Help us to be a pair of Malulamai. Help us to be a risk taker. Help us to push the chips to the middle of the table so that we can leave a legacy for others to follow. God, may others harvest fields that they didn't plant. Help us to sow crops that we will never harvest so somebody else can. God, have your will in your way and start today. Start right now. May the people who leave this church, may the people who walk outside those doors, may they go out to a world that's hungry. God, at the end of the day, all we are are beggars trying to show other beggars where to find bread. You said you are the bread of life. God, thank you for being everything we will ever need. And help us, Lord, to trust you to take that step. In Jesus' name we pray.